Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Andrew Lee. I am the primary person on this project called Glam CSI, and it actually has a really strong tie to Wiki Conference North America, which is awesome to see because you'll always see a direct line between something we do at a conference and an actual, you know, actionable outcome. So the reason why I said there's a direct line, I don't know how many people were anyone at this session last year at Wiki Conference North America. Some of you might have been. Excellent. Let me see if I can hide this thing. Where did I go? I'm screen sharing, but hide video. So is that it? Excellent. So if you were at this session last year, you might have seen that um, after Selena's talk in the morning, we had this session which was kind of informal, but it was meant to be what we call Wiki Tools Roundtable. We tried to get feedback from folks uh, regarding this chart in the lower right hand corner. And I think for a lot of folks, this even just seeing this chart, which is on Wikidata, and it's under Wikidata colon linked open data or WD colon LOD. And it's basically just like a rundown of most of the tools we would think anyone in Glam Wiki would be interested in. And I think for a lot of folks who see this for the first time, like I've never seen all these tools in one sitting before. And that kind of shows you how for most people who want to engage in Glam Wiki work, it's really hard to figure out where to start, what tool should I be using for X and Y. So this chart, or a, a more basic version of it, was started by folks like Alex Stinson and Sandra Hokinier, who were working on structured data at the time. And then I kind of expanded on it to say, let's have a Glam orientation and how could we in one chart show all the most likely tools that Glam professional want to use? And we broke it down into this kind of six step process, your classic case of, if you ever heard the acronym, uh, extract, transform, load, kind of a classic workflow in big data. So you might have your stuff, you want to find out what Wikimedia has and then what you can contribute to supplement what Wikimedia has, or if it's brand new, upload new stuff. Uh, so these are the tools that we had there. And we just had a session at Wiki Conference North America last year, where one, we introduced this chart, which has been around for a while, but a lot of people didn't know about it. And we asked for their feedback. So we actually had stickies and said, you know, do you use these tools? Um, what things worked well for you? What things kind of wore you? We use a very vague term because we don't want to say what things upset you or hard. Just what, what worries you about these things? And then what makes you excited? So just kind of some sentiment around these things. And this exercise of just having some like 30, some very smart folks in the room give us feedback on this was really instructional because it gave us the motivation to go to the foundation and say, hey, I think this merits more systematic study. And fortunately, folks like Giovanna here from the foundation and um, Fiona said, yeah, it actually does. So they funded a project for calendar year 2024 and that's what you're seeing today, which is, I think if I click on this, Glam CSI. So think of that exercise that we had where we're just giving informal feedback on stickies for that chart to be a more formal process of studying how do folks who want to work in Glam Wiki interact with our tools and what kind of experiences do they have, right? So we came up with this idea of let's document what are the user stories behind the use of these tools. Now we've had certain uses of user stories or documenting them in the past, but they really haven't been very regular. We've had some learning patterns documented, we've had some case studies, but we really haven't had a, a real comprehensive look at a set of user stories that maybe cover the gamut of what Glam Wiki folks might be dealing with. Right, so the idea here is a project to assess the contribution pipeline and the technical infrastructure for supporting cultural and heritage partnerships. It's a very long description, um, but we also took a very loose definition of GLAM. So when people ask, like, well, I want, want to tell you my story, but I'm not a GLAM person, I'm not a Wikimedia resident, but that's fine. You don't have to be. So our kind of working definition of GLAM or expanded definition of GLAM is also anyone who's interested in contributing at scale and in complex ways. So I don't know if that's a great definition, but it kind of fits what we wanted to capture, right? That what typically do GLAM institutions, whether you're a museum, historical society, library, what do they do? They want to contribute at scale and they want to probably contribute fairly complex metadata or in complex ways, right? I want to upload a thousand 
records from my library about women authors. What do you have in Wikidata and am I meshing with what you have? So I would say that's at scale and complex, right? So these tools foster those kind of two ways of working. So fortunately we have this grant from for 2024 to work on GLAM CSI. If anyone is not that familiar with the GLAM environment, I always try to point you to the main ways to understand the GLAM community better. We have a newsletter that comes out every month that people contribute to. We have a mailing list, we have a Telegram group, and there's also, uh, there are some affiliates like the Wikimedians in Residence Exchange Network that deal with um, a lot of the things that we're talking about today. So those are ways to get involved with GLAM work. Now, one of the motivations for this project and the motivation for last year's session was we saw a, a kind of a crisis in 2022 with a lot of the tools and techniques that were starting to break down. Um, specifically, I don't know if anyone uses Paddy Pan as an upload tool, but the Paddy Pan tool, which was supported for a while, um, was end of life and was start to misbehave. So you depend on Java and Java was evolving and Paddy Pan did. So there were some problems with Paddy Pan, which is like the only real mass upload tool we had in the community that was easy to use. Um, there was also the failure of some commons metrics tools. Here's a great example of how in October 2022, Smithsonian is not unique in this, that all the stats went to zero. Yikes. This tool that we've been depending on for years to show how, how many people are accessing images that are uploaded by the Smithsonian and other places just stopped working. And you can imagine at the end of the year when you're trying to write your report to your funders to say, here's all the wonderful stuff we did. A lot of people did not get either grants funded or had to tell their employer, trust me, bro which is not a great look for us as a community, right? So that was a big crisis. And we had lots of discussions in the Wikimedia L and other places on what do we do about this? Not to throw blame, but look, this is a crisis we're dealing with right now. Um, this kind of culminated in 2023 Wikimedia. So last year's Wikimedia, when Mike Nickerson, who you might know, was the first Wikimedian at large for New Zealand, the country of New Zealand. He basically said, you know, if we don't fix these things, the whole position of Wikimedian residents might just go away because if we don't fix these things, we can't keep getting funded or supported for this kind of work going forward. And that was a big wake up call for us as a community as well. So what are some of the problems that we saw? Um, not only the failure of some metrics tools, but also some question marks going forward. The Wiki Commons Query Service was launched requiring authentication, which is not exactly what we expected, not only as a community, but the GLAM community, where we see Wiki Data Query Service, anyone can walk up and use it, Wiki Commons Query Service, you have to log in, and that's a big barrier to entry, but you can't just send links to queries. You need to log in for these things, and that's significant. Um, unclear future structured data across Wikimedia, right? There was this interest in putting structured data in all these places around the Wikimedia community. We're not really sure where that commitment is right now, since the SDAW project itself is not a, a thing anymore, right? Uh, desire for key community tools to be professionally supported. So a lot of the tools that we were using that might have been volunteer written or a Magnus tool suddenly became mission critical. But how could we tell the foundation like we really rely on this tool? And that was one of the motivations for this project. Say, let's get some real data behind our observations and start to really um, have some true survey data around what we were observing. So if you want some more background information, we actually had a Glad manifesto that was written in 2023 after this crisis to kind of restate what we were looking for as a GLAM community and to describe what our needs were in terms of metrics. All right, so some takeaways that there was a disconnect sometimes between the Wikimedia tech community, and this is not just the foundation, it's people making tools and the needs of GLAM uh, folks and Wikimedians and residents. Um, this is also just through the passage of time we need to kind of retell the glam story. Uh, you know, it's been 10 plus years since we started a lot of our glam work. Um, and then we also had new employees to the foundation, new people to the movement. And we found that there was no great one telling of, you know, what we were doing as a glam community. Uh, on top of that, there's no real single front door to the glam work, right? Some people approach it from the Wikipedia side, they start as an editor, or some folks might be interested in uploading images, or a librarian might be interested in contributing records. So we actually don't have a single place to really interact with folks interact, interested in Glam Wiki. Um, that's a real problem, right? Is it Meta? Is it Outreach Wiki, which was dedicated to that? So that is a complication as well. Um, and then tracking these projects and the problems people have with these tools is not easy. 
Right, so the solution was to come up with this project to hopefully identify some of the motivations and needs of the wiki community to measure specifically with surveys and with discussions with PLAM professionals and our community on what kind of things they were experiencing to assess these workflows and to document them as key user stories, right? Could we document three, five, seven key user stories that we could design against as tech developers or the foundation, right? And then also to prototype. So use that to maybe prototype some new possible workflows to address some of those issues. That's a lot to do in one year, um, but we've come quite far in uh, October after all this work. So just to introduce some of the folks here that were involved with this, really happy to have the involvement of folks like Jasmine Tanner and Olga Tikunifa from Wikimedia Foundation, who actually uh, went to a hackathon with me to talk to folks in the glam space. So what did we do? So let me just tell you what we did after Wiki Conference North America last year, where we got some ideas on what to do. We said, let's make a real Lime survey tool to go out there and send this to the folks in our community. Um, professional tip, use Lime survey and not Google Forms because a lot of folks in our community hate Google Forms and won't fill out a Google Form. So when you use Lime Survey, they're like, oh, thank you for not stealing my private data and giving it to Google. So just a, a hint for the future. Um, that's our, what's that? <laughs> that's right. They already have it all, who cares? Uh, so what we did, so we've been to a number of in-person events. We also sent out the survey to folks um, who are in our communities, collected individual experiences as well. We actually sat down with a lot of, Folks at the hackathon, we thought maybe we'd have like three, five, seven folks. We had every day, we had over 10 or 12 folks wanted to tell their stories, which is great. Um, so we tried to talk to them, not about just about their stories, but what kind of interfaces they're seeing outside of our glam wiki space. Um, so we started to see some areas of concern in terms of mass contribution by uploading media files, um, working with structured data on commons. You may, may or may not know that some of our tools are not upgraded to work with structured data on commons, like PY Wikibot, for example, or some more APIs. Uh, the need for better metrics tools, we're hearing that a lot, and then desire for innovative interfaces. So we had a lot of folks demo other sites that they wish we could mimic, right, in terms of doing mapping, timelines, visually rich ways of showing things, not just, you know, textual pages, but how can we bring in more interactive multimedia experiences? And that was nice to see that as well. Some examples are here. So some pilot results from the survey data that came back. One was this. So which projects does your organization contribute to select all that apply? So this is what came back. Any interesting observations from this round? Anything stand out? Nobody wants to develop tools. <laughs> Nobody wants to It's a more specialized thing. That's true. Yes. Not everyone can do a tool. That's a good point. Anything else stand out? <laughs> I was surprised too. Yeah, like wiki functions, register on the meter, right? Wiki source is pretty good. I mean, the people at Wikimania said wiki source, yes. But to me, Wikipedia is number three. To me, that's, I don't want to say surprising, but a refreshing data point that kind of you know, confirms what we've been trying to tell a lot of folks saying, you know what, when we go to glam space, commons and Wikidata are often the first thing people talk about. They're like, oh yeah, Wikipedia, number one website in the world, that, that's nice, but commons and Wikidata, that's what we're interested in, right? So we've been trying to tell the foundation for a while, like, you know, I know you really think Wikipedia is the focus of so much and it sh probably should be, but look at this graph. For the glam space, commons and Wikidata are the first door of entry for a lot of these folks, right? So that's interesting to see that with data. Okay. Um, so we introduced this um, chart to folks and we said, we're gonna list these tools in a very extensive list and just check all the tools that you use or you can put other, um, but we use this as a starting point. And what's interesting, we came back says, which tools or scripts do you use for contributing? This was kind of interesting too. Any interesting observations from this? So looking data query service, you can click many tools here. Wiki data query service at the very top, quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of long tail of tools and other. That's right. Any other observations? Catalog is up there, right? 
which I don't know if you've seen, there's been some catalog drama in the last month or so, but uh, so this, what's interesting, I think it's, it's a smattering of different tools, right? Wikidata query service is that kind of officially supported one. Quick statements is a Magnus tool. I think you heard Richard today talk about get quick statements working or Wikibase ain't that useful to us, right? Um, commons upload wizard, so that's a commons tool. Open refine, a third party tool from outside the ecosystem. So you can see that there's not one place to put our energies to fix things. It's really a broad spectrum of tools here. But then catalog as a gadget, ranking this high was a little bit of a surprise to me. How many people here have used Catalog before? Oh, only some of you. Every day. Every day. So Jim, tell us what Catalog does very quickly. It moves, uh, right? Before it's a move a bunch of, uh, of pictures in the subcategories. Right. That's the main thing it does. But it, in general, it does uh, it something very simple to a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, files. Right. So, so the interesting thing about it is this is, I kind of lied before saying that extract transform load is a typical workflow. It's normally extract load, then transform, meaning that you just upload the file first and then you afterwards you go, okay, what category should it go into, right? That's the more practical workflow. Catalog is key to that workflow, which is like shoot first, ask questions later, upload first, recategorize later. And that's what Catalog does with a very nice interface. The problem which you probably know about is recently, they had to slow down Catalog because so many people were using it so fast, it was freezing MediaWiki. Think about that. So this tool was so popular that the developers had to go and go to the code and say, sleep. I mean, if each time you do a move, you got to sleep one second and move, sleep, move, sleep. And that slowed a lot of things down. So you have people like WikiLoss Monuments that upload like thousands of images and they're used to like hitting a button and having the recategorization happen within a minute or two. And that was taking hours and then hours to do the same thing, right? Because they intentionally slowed it down for stability reasons. Now, the cool thing about this, the silver lining is we can point to this chart and say, this is why catalog slowing down is a big deal. Look at how many people use this tool. And we never had this data before, which is kind of neat. So we're already seeing some benefits of the GLAM CSI survey data that we actually have not anecdata data, but data to say catalog is a key tool for GLAM folks, especially Wiki loves contest runners or GLAMs that upload their files and want to recategorize later on, right? And we can go into details later on about why they had to throttle it. But in general, you know, the tool wasn't a big deal in terms of performance when it was not so popular, but so popular now, we're starting to see the problems of operating that quickly, right? So that we're starting to see already benefits of having this uh, ranking of the different tools that are there. All right, so some answers here. I won't spend too much time on it, but they're all on the wiki, which I think are really fascinating to read through because it's a great distillation of many, many different comments here. Why does your organization contribute to Wikimedia projects? Please describe your organization's desired outcomes by contributing to Wikimedia projects. So these are just some basic themes that we saw here. Outreach and public access, by not a surprise, right? It's like it furthers our mission. Um, content accessibility and preservation. A lot of folks say like, you know, I, Wikimedia's been around for 20 years. They probably will be around for another 20 years. They might outlive us, or like they might be better to store it there in case we have a crisis. So preservation and accessibility, um, education and cultural impact, collaboration and community building. This is really refreshing to see that people said it's not just us as the glam gifting you stuff. They found that there are things to be learned from collaborating with the Wikimedia community, which is really cool to see. Um, open science and data sharing. So we've had a lot of specific examples of, you know, projects like open science being uh, or open data and open science being defined as goals of collaboration. And then skill development, institutional benefits, similar to what we mentioned before, that by having your staff participate, they learn open to find, they learn reconciliation, they learn all these concepts that aren't necessarily easy to learn in a smaller environment. So they're actually learning while participating. Promoting diversity and inclusion, and also led to the first part, longevity of Wikimedia as a platform, right? To have access and preservation going forward. What obstacles do you face when contributing to Wikimedia projects with existing tooling? So this is interesting. Um, so it broke down to basically six different areas, technical and tooling issues in terms of tool reliability and maintenance. Um, documentation was a big one, right? There isn't consistent documentation across our tools. Some are better documented and have 
YouTube video walkthroughs, some not so much. Uh, metrics and analytics, that was a big one of finding reliable metrics tools and then lack of standardization, right? And since the tools are made by a wide variety of developers, they don't always have the same philosophy uh, or even the same syntax for certain types of things. Uh, data and metadata challenges. Uh, a lot of this is just simply, you know, how does my data fit into your data? How does my museum modeling fit into Wikidata's modeling? And that could be an issue for a lot of um, organizations if they don't have the experience in doing this kind of thing. And then also just from a technical standpoint, how do they integrate a data set from their organization coming from their API into what can be uploaded into Wikimedia projects? And then resource and capacity constraints. This is more about staffing. Like, do they have the expertise or the personnel to execute on some of these projects? And then there's turnover at these organizations. So sometimes our contacts with these LAM organizations as a community go away and we need to find new contacts. Uh, v, community and cultural barriers. So if you want to put this in a nutshell, like how can I make sure what I upload doesn't get deleted within five seconds by the community, which is a big issue, right? So does my understanding of notability mesh with the community's concept of notability or copyright or um, expired copyright, orphan works, things like that, right? Um, and then like, are there, is there synchronicity between an organization's belief in, you know, cultural sensitivity or honoring certain types of boundaries when it comes to uploading works and the Wikimedia community? So these are big questions that we also saw come up in the uh, survey data. And then specific tool related issues like what tools kind of bubble to the top? Patty Pan and Open Refine both really did bubble up to the top with them being the workhorses of uploading content. Um, Wikidata query services, um, as Wikidata has gotten bigger, it's gotten maybe this slower. So the same query that worked a year ago may not work today, just from the timeouts. Um, and you may know there is a big graph split project going on right now to address some of this. And then mobile and usability issues that the the experience on the mobile and the desktop are very different. And there's some folks who noted those limitations. And then finally, just kind of project specific challenges, um, whether you're dealing with wiki source or comments and wiki data, or how to improve the workflow of some of these um, collaborations. So what we did at Wikimania is we presented those and it was really great to have a lot of the folks who were people would participate in the survey, be in the same room to see some of those aggregate results. But then what we did was we said, let's try to act on some of those outcomes. So what we did is brought this back up again, you know, the six columns here. And then we did something similar to what we did last year, but we said, what would you want to add to these columns? Because we weren't confident we got every tool that should be in there. And then what are some of your positive experiences? Like what do you want a plus one in terms of the tools that you found were useful in these domains? And then what are some of the challenges that we had? So it was great. We had like 30, 40 people in the room going around with post-its, adding their information here. And then you can see from here, some basic patterns, just from the sheer volume of post-it notes, what are some interesting things to note? Where's the density ball? Yeah, challenges to reporting, i.e. metrics tools, right? <laughs> you can see a density of, of them there. But then overall, like, look at the ingest. Like, ingest was like, that is where a lot of our bottlenecks are, or a lot of our concerns are. And then it kind of makes sense. That's one of the toughest parts. Like, how does my data model or media files, how do they mesh with yours, right? That's not easy to do. So just from the visuals, you can see where the concerns were. But what was really cool is that you could actually pull out, so we, transcribed all these down and you can start to see some of those things that are added there. So you can see that this is great because we have a lot of examples of folks who are working in science who had very um, domain specific upload tools. So we actually added things like INAT to Commons, INAT to Wiki, SourceMD, BHL to Wikidata as tools to that chart. Um, we had folks working with video again, like video to Commons kind of came back to life recently. So I think that's great to see. Um, yeah, so you can see that this is the chart before and this is the chart afterwards. We've actually added a lot of information there to that chart based on that feedback, which is great. And then if you look at the ingest challenges, here's kind of a tag cloud from there. You can see break 
was the biggest word that showed up there after you filtered out like Wikipedia and Wikidata. Um, Magnus was in there. Quick statements, wiki shoot me, upload used. I don't know what used would refer to. I guess it means I use this tool, but but break was big in that tag cloud. Uh, so that's the ingest challenges. If we look at reporting challenges, dashboard, data, impact, 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 right? We want to be able to show impact to our employers, show impact to funders. And that was a challenge. And then when it, we saw dashboard, it was both for the Glam Wiki dashboard, as you may know, is run by Wikimedia Israel as a, as a service. Um, and then also the program and events dashboard. So for folks doing edit-a-thons and events, they found that was super important to be able to show results from that to say we fulfill the grant um, because we hit those targets. So dashboard and data, really important here for the reporting. All right, so once we got this, we said, let's not waste an opportunity. Let's get our people in the room and say, how do we address those six challenges? So what we did is we put those six challenges or the obstacle areas up as a chart there. And we said, each of these six areas, we're just gonna have a spread around the room. We want you to go to choose one of these corners and help ideate solutions or ways to address these obstacle areas. So again, technical and tooling issues, uh, data modeling, resource capacity constraints, community issues or culture barriers, content integration and reuse, and then sustainable future, like how do we have durable, sustainable relationships going forward? That's pretty cool to see that people spread themselves out. And these are some of the things that they might want to address. A lot of work was done. What we, in the end, so for each of the, you can see here, Jamie was there. For each of these groups that were there, we said in the end, vote on them, then come up with like three of your most voted on things. So basically each group of those six had at least three, I think we even allowed four, at least three um, post-its that came up and we said, put it on this, Priority matrix, right? So the sum of all those things are put on this matrix here. And we said, so we want you to put it on the scale of whether it's hard or easy. That could be from like, is it technically hard, technically easy, or is it expensive or cheap, right? In other words, ease of implementation. And then on the north-south axis here, it's high priority or low priority, right? Now, obviously, if people are voted on it, it's not going to be low priority, I don't think. So most of them are like kind of middle to high priority. But it was interesting taking these down and seeing where they fell into the, the chart there. So here's where they are. And I've only recently cataloged this, so I'm looking for any insights that you folks might have here. But I tried to at least color code three themes here, if that makes sense. So the way to read this is everything on the, on the right-hand side, see where the yellow one is there? That is basically in the easiest column. All the way left is the hardest column, and then things in the middle are kind of harder or easier. Um, and then what happened was I just color coded them. So, for example, red, I think most of these are around documentation and training. Does that make sense? So, the red ones, are at, they want more case studies, they want buddying up, they want step by step recipes, better onboarding. I don't know if Mary Mark Ockerloom is here, but she has a new workbook that addresses a lot of these things, which is great. And then if you look at the green ones, these are about Easy wins for tools, if that makes sense. So the green ones are prioritize tools that are easiest to use, recognize low-hanging fruit, or systematic tools assessment system by quality and importance. Right? How to highlight tools that are of high use and easy to use. And then the purple ones are like internationalization or multilingual issues, if that makes sense. Language help with non-Roman alphabet, but that's not easy. That requires a lot of developer intervention. And then wiki community training in local context, making things truly multilingual, as a lot of these tools that we're talking about are English only and are not truly multilingual in operation. So those are kind of the three trends that I saw among those. And then I'm not sure about the other black ones. They might be just standalone, but there might be some themes. But as you folks contemplate that, um, Orange Mike, you had a question? Is that right? No, no, you're raising your hand. Um, okay, so any of the things that you see here that might be interesting to hone in on? Or is anything a surprise or confirms anything you thought? Yes. No, I'm not, no, right? So the heart, like when you see the heart in column, but um, I appreciate each and every way to make it like better. But at the same time, heart is always harder than it is to see that. Um, is it really that way? I don't know. I'm not a developer of IAT then, so you tell me. Is it? I mean, it, it depends what exactly. 
Yeah, I, to me, it's it's very vague. I don't know exactly which one that was referring to. It's it's number four, so that would be community issues, cultural barriers. I mean, it, it also, well, not that one specifically, but maybe a lot of the training materials and documentation is not even in multilingual format as well. So, yeah. And here are the things that stand out to you folks. One I had not seen before, which I was kind of like, why didn't we do that before, is the GLAM wish list. And I think that might be taken care of by this new wish list system, but Elena and other folks at the foundation might know better. I, I only know of this new system they have now where they're going to have a continual wish list rather than the old wish list system. They had once a year, and if you made the cut, the foundation or the community would, would approach it, and then the rest just dribbled off and no one ever looked at them again. So I think there's going to be a more continuous system and maybe a categorization system. So that might make sense that the GLAM community can have their own ranking of high priority tools, maybe to keep track of. That might be something worth looking into. Okay. So I thought this was quite useful in terms of getting feedback that we could act on. And we were able to, within the year, not only get the surveys out there, but get people to start creating some solutions to those blockers, which is great to see. All right. Any questions so far? Yes. Just, just a method question. Mm -hmm. The survey at the beginning to kind of kick this off. Yeah. Um, did you go back to that to revalidate that? Hey, this is what we heard in this small group in this workshop. Did you throw it back out to the larger community to validate that it was you, you, the group wasn't misrepresented? Not intentionally. But, uh, <laughs> The sample size is too small for the, the larger community. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we did have a checkbox in there saying, can we follow up with you later on? And I think most people clicked yes on that. Um, so I'm curious to see what your response would be. It's like, hey, if we went back and asked again, like, hey, you guys still agree with us? Is the head in the right direction? Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I'd love to go back with them with some of these outcomes and see what they think. Yeah, that's a great, great question. So that is. Um, you know, just under seven months, well, about seven months worth of work, which is pretty cool to see. Um, and then let me tell you a little bit about the user stories, because one of the goals here was to, in fact, create user stories to capture some of those dynamics, um, because they're much easier to digest when you have a real practical example, right? So if you are not familiar with user stories and software development and product management, it's an informal natural language description, right? It's not a very formalistic description. Um, and written from the perspective of an end user in terms of what they are experiencing or expect to happen in a system. So we usually have things like a persona where you try to describe the background of a person and what motivations they have for their work. You also have a user scenario, which has a basic narrative of what their task is ahead of them. And then you just document their user journey in terms of the decisions they make, the obstacles they might run into and the tools they select. So one example I use, which is fairly typical, is maybe a glam professional who wants to upload content to Wikimedia Commons, right? So typically what we do is we write a background about someone like this saying they have this role as an outreach coordinator and they are interested in contributing information about emerging artists. So with that background, you'll normally have a statement like this that sets the table for the user story. So as this gallery outreach coordinator, I want to upload high resolution images of artworks from our collection to Wikimedia Commons so that the artworks are accessible to global audience and can be used to enrich related Wikipedia articles. So pretty typical first task for some glams who want to be involved with the Wikimedia content. Okay. So this might be just a very basic narrative of how someone like Casey approaches the problem, right? So find the case you might find a Wikimedia Commons category that um, might already been contributed in some way. This is also fairly typical, especially if there's a GLAM professional coming in late in the game, you might have had either volunteers upload content there already. So different formats, different image quality, different naming schemes. So even just excavating what's there already or what categories exist already is take some work. Um, and then trying to compare what the museum wants to contribute to what's there already in Commons or in Wikipedia is interesting. And then typically what they'll do is upload the images to Commons and then clean up 
the upload later on, as I mentioned, the extract load transform. And then you might want to enhance it with structured data on commons or eliminate any possible duplicates. We are still dealing with lots of duplicates for like the Smithsonian and the Met Museum because there's just so many images that these folks have online. So if we want to get more detail into it, we are interested in this level of detail when it comes to a user story. So even when it comes to things like what's on commons already, <clears throat> that's not always easy, right? The person needs to kind of know what tools we have for downloading metadata or inspecting tools there. And then when it comes to permissions, you know, that is a whole nother ball of wax, right? So we, I put in here the tools and links to get in touch with VRT or the volunteer response team. How many people here have ever dealt with VRT or the volunteer response team? Okay, some of you, foundation people have, uh, but maybe not everyone. So what you may not know is that oftentimes if a GLAM institution doesn't have a very clear description that they are open access, right? Like they don't have something on their website that says, we release all this for open access. If you upload a file from that LAM institution to commons, you often have a commons community member or administrator say, I don't, who are you? And is it clear you have permission to upload this stuff? So that's where VRT comes in. Uh, the best way to do it is to have someone with an official email from the institution email VRT and say, by the way, this is our account. These are the files. We pledge and confirm that these files are available under a free license or under public domain. And then that's that record is there. Now, the funny thing is that that record is kind of secret. So the VRT, I think ID number is pasted onto the file, but that's it. Like, so the permission is confirmed through this email correspondence with the GLAM institution. And that's what VRT is. And this will often be a big sticking point, right? Of having just to walk a GLAM institution through all these hoops they need to jump through just to confirm that the person uploading has permission to upload with the right license. All right, so when it comes to actually um, looking at what's there already, they might have to learn a tool like PetScan, or if they're technically capable, maybe POI Wikibot to write their own script to do so. But oftentimes, PetScan is the more user-friendly, I put that in quotes, uh, tool to do this. It's the only kind of out-of-the-box tool to do a lot of kind of category uh, inspection a lot of the time. All right, so that's just one part of it. If you want to see the full um, user story, you can go there and see that for the uploading story. Another one that we thought was great that we ran into at the hackathon was just the sheer number of folks doing Wiki Loves Monuments or Wiki Loves Projects, which is a massive contribution of visual content from largely new people. So most of the folks participating in Wiki Loves Monuments as the world's largest photo contest, about 50% are brand new editors. Yeah, that's pretty significant to have to deal with that many newbies so quickly, right? So we had this story that was run by that was written by Darina from Ukraine, and it was a, it was eye opening because I did not know all the tools they were using. Some of these tools, like eight, nine years old, that have not been upgraded, and they're kind of working with duct tape and spit to keep going. And it was an appeal from a lot of Wiki Loves Bodies people saying, "Please give it some love," because I'm not sure how long it's going to work, keep working, which is fascinating to see. So you can see that what they're looking for more is like more detailed real-time information so they can find out how to support new users better when they're uploading content. So you know, I had no idea tools like this existed until I sat down next to her and she was demoing these tools. And you can see how far back these tools go to back in 2010. Um, Wiki loves Africa, Wiki loves Earth, Wiki loves Monuments. So Wiki loves Monuments has been so successful. It's spawned all these other contests that happen year round which is why tools like Catalot probably get ranked very high in terms of need because they need to recategorize all these things all the time. So they actually have the tool called heritage.toolforge.org that you've never seen before um, that they use to go through the images of categories to inspect them and quickly assess their quality, which is pretty cool to see. Right. So um, you can see some of the current user stories that are there. These are the ones that are fleshed out quite well. There's also one that's dealing with more wiki data and reconciliation of how to align one data set with wiki data to upload them. And I thought this would be an interesting time to kind of turn attention to one or two tasks. So there's two things that we could do. One at Wikimania, we actually had some folks start contributing user stories, which has been really great to see. Um, and we're, we want to make sure we're capturing a good range of user stories. Let me show you what 
we're thinking of in terms of how to uh, have a good spread of user stories. And the way that we do this, and yet another quad chart, is to think about whether the we're capturing a full range of kind of simple to complex user stories, but also whether we're capturing small scale contributors and large scale contributors, right? So this is kind of the, the universe of types of contributors we're thinking of here. So for example, if we're thinking of someone who's running a Wikipedia edit-a-thon event, where would we put that in the quad chart? Do you think? You're running an edit-a-thon, 20 people show up, edit articles, where would that be? Lower, yeah, it's a small scale. We're not talking like thousands of images or anything. Simpler or complex? Probably on the simpler side, right? You don't expect them to be brilliant editors right away, right? So you probably put it down here. It's kind of small scale, simple. Doesn't mean it's unimportant. It can have a high impact, but it's at the scale of, of simpler and small. How about local wiki-based installation? We got the perfect guy right there to ask about that. Where would you put it? <laughs> top, top left or top right? Yeah, I put it there, right? <laughs> Pretty much, right? <laughs> So we don't know, um, Rich is running the, the whole wiki names project for Smithsonian and we're doing a wiki based installation and it's been interesting. <laughs> so it, it's, it's complex, but hopefully very rewarding at the same time, right? Um, ESA tool is one we're profiling right now. ESA, if you've ever used this tool, is like a point and click image tagging interface, which is quite nice, especially for mobile. This is showing in the desktop interface, but on the mobile, you can just use your thumb to you know, help tag images. So this has been very popular um, among communities in Africa where they can just have a room full of folks with mobile phones help contribute to adding structured data to Commons files. Where did we put this? If we talk about ESA tool, mobile image tagging, it's not that hard, but it's fairly medium scale, right? You can have a room full of 50 to 100 folks tagging multiple images there, right? So that's somewhere in there. So what we wanna do is make sure we're having a good spread here, right? If we're choosing three to five stories, we wanna make sure we're hitting the right spectrum here, um, which is what we're kind of doing right now to make sure we're hitting all these different things here. But we can also think of other types of projects that start filling in the landscape here. For example, 3D models and files, I think since, since this project started, the front page of Commons now has 3D files or 3D models on the front page of Commons now. And for years, it never had a link to the 3D content. So I think that, that's refreshing to see, but we don't support very advanced 3D file formats. We only support like a very basic wireframe format. Um, Event-based image contribution, Wiki loves photo campaigns. Are we keeping up with the volume of those? Um, and then, you know, on an institutional level, you might have seen one of the feedback uh, comments before of saying people are interested in kind of like, once I've contributed content to Wikidata, how to make sure it's bi-directional flow, right? What we call kind of round-tripping data. That is not easy. And that's what I would call like institutional collection, image metadata contribution and synchronization. That's really complex, right? That's a special case though, I think. So if we're to look at the participation frequency, so if we're to look at it in another dimension, like which one of these are kind of heavy participation or heavy occurrences or light? And we're probably seeing that we see a lot of like list reconciliation tasks. Like we want to contribute like their set of artists, photographers, things like that. Um, and we're seeing a very dense middle there in terms of list reconciliation. Um, edithons are medium frequency. Wikilove's photo campaigns are getting bigger and bigger in terms of the, the number of them. Um, and then most of the other of those, most of these are not very high in terms of participation frequency, but they're complex, right? So you don't have hundreds of museums experimenting with Wikibase, but you have some very key libraries and museums doing that. So this is just kind of a, a first run at trying to make sure that we're hitting a bunch of different types of projects as we're profiling them. But it'd be nice to see if you folks had other use cases that could help fill in this chart here. Ones that you know of or involved with, we'd love to hear more about this. You can see the types of tools that are critical to each of these areas, right? If we're talking about um, 
institutional collection image metadata contribution, which is like right in the middle, right up here. There's a complex set of tools there. And then Richard, I should have put a lot more here, like open refine and quick statements and all the tools you've been trying to get working, right? It's a whole basket. And writing your own scripts, right? Yeah, PY Wikibot and everything, right? So there's a whole bunch of complexities there as well. So again, this is just a first run at trying to profile the different type of projects and then the tools that tend to be seen in these areas. Um, and I think that's really a useful uh, map to have as we move forward. All right, so when it comes to activities, I think that we can do one of two things, or you could do one of two things. One is we do have stickies and markers. If you want to try to write your own user story, at least sketch it out, we actually have that. You can either sketch it out on the Etherpad or we have markers and post-it so you can actually move things around and, and model things. Or I would be also be interested if you had any other ideas for implementing possible solutions to the six areas that we talked about before, right? Or any insights on how to act on any of these things, right? So when it comes to glam wish list or how to do, uh, you know, more technical support for wiki-based integrations. These are all things that you might have insights on or know of efforts in these areas right now. So um, I'd be very interested to find out about those things. This is a more of a radical idea that someone came up with because as you may know, we have enterprise API now where we quote unquote charge the big guys to have uh, upgraded API access. But some folks are asking, well, why, how come we don't have the same service for Glams? Maybe we can have a service where if Glams are willing to pay, we have some kind of partnership we could do with that. It's an idea. So um, yeah, I didn't think of that before, but it's possible. So these are the two activities I think that would be useful here is that you can start drafting new user stories. And I'm happy to take a look at them and we can think about that. Or if anyone wants to work on one, you can raise your hand and say, I wanna work on a user story about X and see if anyone else wants to collaborate with you on those things or propose possible implementation ideas or solutions for these things here. So yeah, I think we have an etherpad. Let me see if we can have that come up here in a second. Yeah, here's our etherpad. And this etherpad has a link to this presentation. So if you need to review anything that we have here, that would be the way to go. Um, so let me get back to... Yeah, so it would basically be this set of possible solutions and obstacles here, um, where if you can think of solutions here or give feedback on any of these that we found as the, the ones that people ranked, that would be great because um, right now, I think there are some things like, I would immediately point to Mary Mark Ockelblum's, was it Glam Workbook or Wikimedia and Residence Workbook that she had as a possible solution to this, right? or new documentation efforts that are being done to help solve some of these problems, or go through and start creating your own user stories or drafting user story. And I'm happy to help um, take a look over your shoulder to see what kinds of things you could fill in as parts of that user story. Let me come back here and show you what that looks like. And basically all you need is that. If you can start with that, that would be great. Just say, as someone in a role, you want to do X, for what outcome? And that's kind of the basic user story thing. So, right. Yes. Good question. So, since the metrics and reporting sorry, comes up a lot, is that something which should be its own user story? Is that like baked into one of the personas that they carry it all the way to the end of the logical chain? That's a good. That's a good question. It's an inherent in the situation. Sure. Yeah. Different people want to measure it by different standards, and that they're the client. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. They're used to paying for analytics, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, Sarah, you're in the middle of a lot of that before, but that's like one of the few things people are willing to pay for and big money too, right? Is the metrics and impact tools, right? 
Is money the limiting factor? And yeah, like, like to be people, is in terms of like, a lot of these things kind of sound like, to an extent, like short revenue. That would have to go and think about. Right. I think what it would basically be. But it seems like there is money floating around in this space. Like, is getting more money really the thing that's needed here? Like, we could charge a bunch because I'm sure more money is always nice. But, like, it doesn't sound like we're at a state where there's like zero dollars available. Like, is the lack of money really the thing that's preventing? I don't know, some sort of system where someone gets paid to fix the pipeline. Um, the good question. Um, I wish Kevin Peirabi were here, but but recently the foundations changed how much they will fund technical projects. My understanding is it's severely limited versus, versus what it was before. So I think that definitely comes into play. Is that just in terms of applying the foundation for a technical development grant is much harder than it was even like a year or two ago. I don't know, Giovanni, whether you know that's true. Is that that's pretty much true. I don't know how well I'm characterizing it, but all I know is from the side of the community I've heard from multiple folks, it's much harder to get grants for software development these days. So in that sense, yes, it is harder, but the money is more scarce. Um, but I mean, just kind of from the outside, it doesn't seem it like, it seems like more of the problem is like finding someone almost or like, or like how you kind of stand with the but like, it doesn't look like Someone tried to arrange something to fix it, but like you needed dollars, you couldn't get it. It kind of feels more like no one has really tried to get it fixed, but just looking from the outside, it hard. Like it doesn't seem like there are failed efforts to get it fixed, but more like I don't think they do that for money multiple times. I think it's just as like maybe a lack of organization around efforts to like mm -hmm. I don't know like the power of the is not working. So I would get the work piece of something or something to do it right. Like it doesn't sound and, and like it kind of from the outside it doesn't really sound like we reached a stage where we have to just find a place and we just need like, dollars to make it happen like what we do work for kind of way up where dollars are just like the time to do anything. Um, does that make sense? Um, yes. I mean, that's one reason why we did the survey, right? Just to say, you know, where are dollars best spent? Um, because we can kind of keep repeating that a lot of people want patty pan working, but then now we actually have, you know, real data behind it. Um, patty pan's a weird case because it is one where it could have kept working if it was architected better, but it depended on some really wonky Java libraries. And those Java libraries kept getting either uh, deprecated and or like modified because of security problems, I, I understand. So it just like Patty Pan just kept breaking under the weight of Java FX, whatever that ball of wax is. So that was the, the big problem. I think there have been some attempts to rewrite it in a way that doesn't depend on that, but they've been slow, right? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I don't know how it's not live now, and I don't know when it's going to be or like what it's being signed on, but I don't know what it's going to be. Right, right. Yeah, so Alvin Larson, I don't know if you know him from Sweden, great guy. He's <laughs> pitched in to keep Patty Pan kind of going, like just on triage mode, <clears throat> but he has uh, in mind a more clean rewrite of Patty Pan, so it's more usable. Uh, or a patty pan replacement. I don't even think it's patty pan itself. With right, that's right. And we have one of the big problems with patty pan is it's just it's a file upload, and you can include like one one template and and categories, and that's it. So it doesn't deal with structured data. Like if you know exactly the queue number of what it depicts, you can't do anything like that. You can't do anything with it on patty pan. So a more modern upload tool that works with structured data that would be nice. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, that's not a bad one to do is like a, someone who can kind of do PY Wikibot or Python and the experience that they have, right? Which is that PY Wikibot really doesn't have great support for structured data on commons, right? You can finagle it, but it's it's not built for it right now, right? That's a good point, yeah. Yeah, that's, 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 that's useful to see because we there's no, it's not rare to find folks in the lab space that know Python and would pick up those kind of more programming tools to, to do Python work. But um, yeah, Py, PyWikiBot has some interesting old school uh, philosophies on how to, yeah, how to operate. Let's put it that way. <laughs> and it doesn't support SDC. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it is old. Yeah, exactly. And the, I mean, we can also look at this to see if we didn't take a close look at the other parts of this graph. Like, are there any interesting things from here? Yeah. Oh, the color for that, but I, you know, that sort of thing. So you can see all the tools versus the right. know, internal versus external and that sort of thing. Right. That's and a great point. It's silly. Um, I'm like, you know, it's a really easy fix for that. Just say no to the authentication. Uh, Imagine that. <laughs> I don't know, like, why it's authenticated or what's involved, but, like, you know, it seems like that shouldn't be that hard to change it. Like, you know, someone somewhere has to do this, right? But, like, I guess what I'm saying is, like, some of these things don't seem like earth shattering. Things to change for six month long projects. Like, surely someone just has to turn on the foundation. Right. And then that was part of the motivation for this project, even. I think that was something I didn't go deep into, but one of the, or some of the documents that I pointed to at the beginning for why are we doing this project was specifically around that. How did you make the decision to launch Wiki Commons Query Service authenticated versus open? Like, you must have had a fear factor or an expectation of how it's going to be used. And that's why you started this way, but we didn't know what that was. Yes. Awesome. Great. Should I give you this? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, right. So I'm Todd Taylor. I'm with the foundation of uh, the data engineering. Um, I think briefly there, was a fear factor. It was pretty well founded at the time because the team that was responsible for the study of construction was first platform. This is to say that like the, the query services are actually something they kind of do off the side of their desk mm -hmm. platform company. And as you may be aware, the display strategy under which the query service had had significant scaling and performance. And the easiest way they could think of at the time to limit load on that service was to put a log in front of it. Because they were worried about what unauthenticated public access might be. And what's interesting is it's like, was that a surmountable problem at the time? I don't know. I can't, like, I don't want to go back and relitigate the kind of technical decisions. But what I can tell you that we see now on the APIs that are authenticated is significant degrees of increased scraping that we think we can trace mainly to like AI related companies. And they're actually putting significant load on our resources here at the point that we're trying to figure out what to do about it. Mm -hmm. Right. So I'm so now looking at like thinking about how easy it is now, like the the reason we needed to split the blade wrapper for Wikidata is because a single poorly crafted query is capable of taking down the entire database. And that is the kind of problem they were worried about. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I think that's important to note that 
in some sense, it's like that's just a search team. I I my understanding is the foundation of the organized set is a very different structure. Right? Not that part. Not that part. Okay. So it's my my metaphor I use is like if you're on a cruise ship, you can't expect the people working in the engine hull to understand what the passengers up top are expecting, right? So that's kind of what we were seeing is that when we had a kind of our, our more land ish community had a meeting with the search team, we asked them, like, well, so we understand from the load issues whatever, that, that you launched it authenticated, but what user story are you designing against to have made that decision? And they said, well, you know, that one, the next one, that's why yeah. I should copy that. Another deficit for not having a dedicated engineering team is not having a product manager. Right. Mm -hmm. And we don't assign product managers where they can't direct engineering research. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. But I think part of it also is that the philosophy of search is that's sort of an ancillary function to what is, or side function to what is primarily, you know, you're going to Wikipedia to read a page or find that page. And the thing we try to get through, and it's not the search and search team's fault, is that with Wikidata and Wikicom, it's a different philosophy. Your land, your experience is not the one file in common. Your experience is not the one Wikidata item. It's the search interface is that content. It is the front door of content. It's not a support function to get to a page. It's a very different philosophy around content. I don't think we've ever really had that reckoning in our community to say that the search query is now a primary content. Yeah, vector. Right. And so, and, and those tools are mainly maintained by the community to which then. Exactly. Right. So even internally, we're not really. Right. Okay. Right. And even us, the glam community, we, we haven't wrapped our head around that yet. It's like, you know, how do we think about the, the experiences we're trying to assemble with all these uploads, right? So that's what, you know, the thing I showed this morning, the reason why I think it's so powerful with the knowledge graph content is that it is something that most people have never seen before, right? If I go to, this is a more simple version of, of it. But something like this is now what I consider the primary content of, or primary way of accessing Wikidata. I'm not visiting individual queue number items. I want to hit a query and interact with the content this way and start surfing through and navigating and exploring here, right? And that's something that, it's hard to necessarily to explain to a lot of folks who are not used to seeing interacting with Wikidata or Wikicommons query service like this, right? And this is you know this is the one kind of content that always turns the heads of our GLAM partners when they say, "I get it," right? So, for example, Sarah here worked for years on linked open data projects. It's always abstractly linked open data until you see this and you go, "Ah, that's what you've been doing this whole time," or "That's the payoff," right? Um, and look, we've been doing this for like a few years and we still haven't had massive buy-in from our community that this is a primary interface to our content. We love for it to be, but it's right now still, you know, an aspiration to have these things because there's no great easy way to assemble and make these things. And that's another thing we're hearing back. I don't know if you folks have heard it, but Cleveland Museum of Art, I remember my talk this morning, it was one of the first ones to hop on and they... You know, for years they uploaded content. They said, "Here's all the great stuff. Now show us the the magic. Show us this stuff." And we're like, ah, "We don't have the tools to do this easily. We don't have a community of practice that does this. We don't have beautiful interactive multimedia interfaces." And that's when folks like Cleveland said, "Okay, well, we're gonna stop our wiki activities. Call us back when you've got something better." And that's sad, is that we're missing an opportunity to really capitalize on the fact that they're interested, they're enthusiastic, but we're not meeting the challenge necessarily. Um, and even if we don't have the perfect interfaces, we don't have what the Commons Career Service open for tool making, right? So I understand that completely the, the reason why you want to throttle WCQS, but we don't even have an authentication model. We don't have a way for yeah. a script writer to get a token easily to uh, authenticate against it. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. To the, the reason I asked about the I think competition, right? So we can spend time in organization um, mm -hmm. working on websites, you can spend it on social media, and you're gonna have really good tools from 
Google Analytics to different social media reporting tools. We're going to create a little restricted dashboard for you. It's going to be very, very clear where your investment and you know meta is going to pay off in terms of audiences. But we really want to convince decision makers about how to put time and resources and efforts and the visualizations we can get back there, lists of numbers or a, a graph that goes down and disappears because of tool growth. It's it's really hard to make that um equivalency case for you know actually this is a waste of time to you know do all this work on your own websites when you could be getting you know hundred X reach if you're working in a third party that you need to be able to uh, compete with those um, private tools that are um, visually compatible and often you know to sell ads but um, you know, you need to speak to the sort of business mind of decision makers and who's involved in the organization. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. It's kind of like you have a social media manager of an organization that just thinks about the total social media footprint and kind of impact. Same thing, you probably have someone in the management organization, just like across all the Wiki properties, what's our impact? And having a user story just oriented around that with some metrics of how much. We have in common to get out of Wikipedia, everything that we're from this story. So, yeah, I think technical contributor, Python scripting, someone's honed in on metrics and impacts. Those are some good ones. Yep. Yes. Just a curiosity. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not in the lab community, but I'm in the information places, I guess you could say, mm -hmm. um, so, so to talk about link data and all that sort of stuff, and I'd really like to get you guys with this. Is there anything in the, this ecosystem about inferred? I think this is connected to that sort of relationships. I see a lot of explicit relationships, so this is connected to that, that we can visualize it in the data sciences area that, that makes a whole lot of sense. But when you get to the probabilities of it, I think this is connected to that, right? and especially for the event community, I think it would be helpful to say, I'm not going to give you the total answer, but I'm 70% confident that this might be related to that. Just kind of filter down your workload back to what you were talking about earlier about um, I think this connection, but a human has to look at it. So is there any sort of aids like that that would be in the pipeline? Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, really, the, the, the research yeah. is there and inferring and like that. Oh, the research is there. I just think oh, there's tooling in the wiki spaces for that. Right. And, uh, uh, that's a great question. I've, I've seen it in really expensive commercial tools that my company pays for, oh, but right. I've not seen it in. So space. it's funny you mentioned that because I was just talking to Zach last night about this the exact thing that we actually do have uh, like tool games in our community mm -hmm. where they have candidates saying, we think this is pretty good or close, but we want a human to be able to say yes or no to. Right. Like, these are candidates for matches, these are candidates for this equals that. Yeah. And so we have a game interface. Um, okay. but, yeah, game interface. but I don't know, Zach, you have opinions about how creaky or healthy this is. And I, I agree with you in that it's a decade old kind of uh, infrastructure and it's starting to show its age. And I'm not sure how active the community is around it, given a lot of these games are not really functioning correctly anymore. But. Yeah, so uh, a lot of the particular uh, games on there are the last time they were updated for like 2017. Um, and the interface doesn't seem to be kind of functioning very well. Uh, it, and some of them are pretty updated. Like there's, there's one entire one that just like wants to put people in categories male and female. Right? Mm -hmm. It's like, well, I don't actually know who this person is. Right? Also, we've only provided the game to options, <laughs> which I think we're a little bit past now. So uh, I think that there are ways that it would be a huge opportunity, especially for what I kind of think of as a lot of really kind of like low, uh, maybe a little chart there, like the low, you know, uh, uh, effort and also not going to take a lot of time or and be able to do things like, and I was just playing with Lisa, like be able to show not just students, but potential teachers and others like how to play with data, like how these things work, it's really like when they're able to just add a tag and see how that kind of restructures things, it's actually really amazing. But it seems to be a lot of these kind of low effort ways that we haven't maintained on our bomb ad. I'd love to see those all better. Yeah, that's a great point. And actually, it brought me to look at where Wikidesk distributed game is on this chart. It's actually not that high. 
I bet you he did the survey maybe five, seven years ago. It might be higher. Yeah, people were talking about it all the time back, right? back in the day. But like, if you go to it now, like it looks really out of date. Like, really right. out of date. Right, right. There's also the, the issue of like a lot of low hanging fruits and picks with some of the earlier tasks, but I don't think that explains everything. That distributed game could be more up to date, perhaps. Yeah, Joel. Um, talking about the type of game. Um, I think you know it's about the place of communicating for students, communicating for the management department, but it's also um, a possibility that is also very interesting for institutions themselves and like students and institutions where they do have like very interesting space as a max that you guys like presented a game like in person or to go more uh, more in this event. Um, and I guess this possibility was a little bit damaged because um, at the time we had met like all of the past, right? I think we lost a little bit of time in the past. If all the museums were closed, but the library museums were closed for two years. Um, and I'm saying that because I think, um, in a way, slow and improve, but at the same time, it can be something that the institution themselves could help to uh, fund because it could be something like it's something that could be there physically engaged with their their visitors, uh, young visitors in the uh, uh, education activities that is their institution. So that this for me a little bit is game um, uh, and uh, the heritage. I think it could be something that we could maybe think maybe think more in this capacity of like maybe this is not. Something for us to to, to be able to manage fund that way, but maybe we should be because this is like we are always talking about how like we need to fund this, we need to develop this this work, and it's true. Like there is also the institutions out there that could help have our funding and more funding we have, mm -hmm. right? So maybe this is. Um, Yeah, that's a great idea. I've never thought of like going back out to the lab institution and say, hey, we have this game framework. Oh, okay. Why don't you plug into it? Yeah, because this was the case for me a few years ago. The Fountain Museum Gallery they actually funded us to develop the games for that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, especially with AI. AI can do a lot of great recommendations relative to yeah. what we had five or seven years ago. So uh, I think that's great. Really be human. Yeah, exactly. Still defer to humans. I agree. But yeah, I'm glad you, you mentioned that because now it got me to double check the Wikidata distributed game. And I don't think there are any other gaming tools in the top ranks there, which we should be, I don't know if we should be worried about, it, but we should be like scratching our heads saying, mm -hmm. I thought the gaming interfaces were a lot more useful in the past. So it's good to know. Yes. Any other comments or questions? We have a few minutes left. Yeah. But just to build on that game, there's ways that that has been done for years, but it takes a lot of research to do it well that it can cause damage at scale. So having the extra tools to actually check if that question is appropriate or if the functional Behavior how it's been implemented in those museums they have checked is really critical. And this is we've seen this in the citizen science space very previous games. So there's definitely literature to definitely look at before jumping into mm -hmm. let's just map the what is you know, we don't make that out. Yeah, that's a great, great point. Anything else from folks? Otherwise, great, great feedback. I'm gonna take this back and so we enhance our notes from those sessions there. And I just am very grateful to folks who came to the first one last year, which kicked off a lot of what we're talking about today. So it's great to see so much progress in one year, going from kind of vague concept to actually survey, meetups, ideation, and solutions being put forth. So thanks everyone for participation and keep watch at the Glam CSI page on Meta, we'll be putting up more reports there, but you can read the full description of what we did with Humania if you want more details on what we've done so far. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm.